morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Lighthouse Discipleship Center. This is Dave Everett. And uh, anyway, just thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a couple announcements to get started and our, just our regular announcements. Uh, first of all, we will have a Bible study tonight at 6 o'clock right here on Facebook Live. And uh, so thank you for joining us for that. And then uh, we have ongoing Bible classes. And they're on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org. And uh, they're free. All you got to do is register. It's free. And it's just a, a registration process so we can forward you the password and login information uh, whatnot. So you can take those at, at your own leisure, at your own pace. And so anyway, uh, and then I also just want to continue those who have been following us regularly here on uh, uh, our Bible studies and our, 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 our church. Uh, thank you for those who do give regularly. But those who are interested but didn't know how, uh, you can uh, support our ministry by going to lighthousediscipleship.org, go to our give page, and uh, we'll just follow a few little prompts, and uh, you can give very easily, whether it be ongoing or whether it be uh, a one-time uh, offering. So thank you for those who have been supporting us, uh, and uh, uh, we've seen an increase in this last month, and so that we are seeing that. Uh, we thank you for that. So we can continue to do what God has called us to do, and uh, we can uh, and also too if we if we can uh, support you with any prayer requests, or not, you can go to either our website, go to our contact page, or uh, just make it leave a little uh, uh, messenger uh, if you want a private, uh, or even just uh, even just put on the bottom. Can you contact me for uh, prayer requests, and we will follow up with you on uh, your messenger or whatnot. And so. Um, Anyway, so there's different ways that we can still, still reach out to you uh, for pastoral care and uh, uh, prayer if you need it. So anyway, let's go ahead and jump into our message this morning. If you'll go in your trophy in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 36, start going in that direction. Ezekiel 36, that's been our theme verse. Uh, this will actually be the last message of this series, but I'm going to do... What is basically a continuation of this a series called Rest in His Goodness. Uh, it's really, I've been struggling whether to just keep that in the same heading or just make it a different series tag and all this uh, all together. And so it's really a continuation of this message because I've been referring to that uh, at least toward the beginning of this series about when I'll be talking about rest. And uh, it really goes with this message, but I think uh, just for referencing purposes in the future, I'm just going to make it its own, um, own category, so our own title, uh, Rest in His Goodness, so we'll start that next week, um, so, <coughs> uh, excuse me, so go ahead, Joe, me, if hopefully you've been there, or in that direction, is Ezekiel chapter 36, we'll pick it up in verse 33, and uh, these have been the main uh, theme verses for this series, and let's go ahead and read this morning. God says, Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all of your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled, instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted, de wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the nations which are left all round you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. And I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do I love this passage of scripture. We're going to look at uh, a few more uh, this morning about how God restores. And I titled this message about the garden restored. Uh, there's two. There's really twofold purpose of that. First of all, the garden. The garden is where I, where everything started. It's where God uh, started His own relationship with man before He created Adam and Eve. God had a relationship with Adam, uh, and, and even so with Eve, and I'm not 
I'm not picking favorites, male and female. I'm just, God created a relationship with mankind. And he did the same with Eve, I believe, when Eve came into the picture. And so, and that's how God wanted it. That God wanted a relationship with man. And, uh, and, you know, I picture myself when I'm praying with God or having my most intimate times with God. I'm walking with God in the cool of the day, just like Adam and Eve did uh, before the fall, before there was sin, before there was sickness, before there was lack, before there was marriage problems and political things and whatever going on in the world. Uh, there, God had a relationship with man. Man lost that intimate relationship because of sin. But that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to restore a right relationship with us. For he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So that we might become, that we might be born of a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we can come to the tree of life just like Adam did. Jesus is our tree of life. And we can come freely to his throne of grace to receive mercy in our time of need. We can come freely and we can we, we receive not only from the tree of life, but we can have a right relationship with God. And that's why even on the picture, if you can see it on your screen, but <clears throat> I always have an image that kind of uh, shows uh, what this series is about, but I see us walking with our Abba in the cool of the day. I see us walking with our Daddy, with our Abba, with our God, with our King, with our Savior, with our Healer, with our Provider, anytime we need. Uh, you know, my, my, my dad and I, we, we, uh, he shares uh, a verse with us every morning. And one of the verses he shared this morning was that we, Jesus, where he's, he's sharing this from John chapter 14, that Jesus said, we can ask anything in his name and he'll do it. You know, six times God, Jesus says that in John 14 to 16. John 14 to 16, the context is Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And he's getting ready to go and do what he came to do. But he also, in that time, he talks about the Holy Spirit that will come. And he says six times in that passage, and six times in his closing discourse with his most intimate disciples, he says, you can ask anything in my name, and I'll do it. Six times he reiterates that, that, that truth. And so not only can we trust it because Jesus said it, not only can we trust it because God said it, but we can trust it even more, I believe, because he said it six times. Six times in the same context. But God created a relationship with us. God created us for intimacy and a relationship. We lost that to the fall. But God has restored that relationship through Jesus Christ. God, whatever has been lost because of sin, God has restored to us through Jesus Christ. That's a major point that I'm making in this series. God has restored that. And God says he will restore double. And we're going to go into that double uh, portion this morning. Um, God is restored double. God wants to restore. You know, there's different reasons why in sin we've lost things. Some of it's because of our own folly, of our own stupidity and, 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 uh, and, and failure and, and, and sin and, and lust and different things of that nature. We've lost everything. We've turned up, some of us, we've made a, a, a wreck uh, of our lives. There's nothing but a train wreck. And it's like, how can we even we pick up the broken pieces? Well, we can't. But in Christ we can. In Christ, and only in Christ, can we can, can, can God pick up the broken pieces that we've made, the mess that we've made through sin, and pick it up and not only restore, but restore double. Also, in, that, in addition to that, maybe some of our, our, our messes is not because of something we did, but because of something someone has done to us. Some of us have been violated. Some of us have been abused. Some of us have gone through things because of something others have done to us. And our life, in a very similar fashion, is like nothing but a train wreck. Because we've been a victim of something. But we've also made it worse by having a victim mentality instead of a, 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 a victor mentality. And some of us, yes, what has happened to us is horrible. It's beyond horrible. But because of a victim mentality, because of the emotional scar and trauma we have gone through and we continue to go through, we have actually made it worse. And then we look at our lives as ruined, 
because whether because of our own sins or because of because of somehow someone has sinned against us. We we're like, how can we even take the room and the broken pieces and make something beautiful? You know, that's what's so so beautiful about a, a mosaic. I don't understand everything about a mosaic art. But they will use to take the broken pieces and the shattered pieces of, of pottery or glass or whatnot, and they will they will mold it together into something beautiful. You know, even uh, um, there was something else I was going to illustrate, but I just forgot what that is called. But uh, you know, it's just uh, uh, but, but I don't want to lose my thought in trying to figure out what that is. It's just you know, God wants to take the ruins and He wants to make it beautiful. Last week I talked about jubilee. How God, it, Jesus is our jubilee. And the anointing of God is on our lives, on your life, on my life, because we have received the Holy Spirit. You know, I mentioned already in John 14 and 16 how Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit in context. And he said, six times if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. You know, uh, and, and that he even says in, in John 16, 14 to 16, that the Father might be glorified. Ask anything in my name, I'll do it. God is glorified when we ask. God is glorified when He shows Himself to be God and to be our Father and to be our, our healer. But He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us. He, the Spirit of God has anointed us, quoting from Isaiah chapter 61, and He has anointed us to heal the brokenhearted. God has not only anointed you to re restore the ruins in your life, but God wants to use you, a restored, uh, a restored vessel, so He can fill this vessel, this jars of clay with His glory, that God can use you to bring healing and restoration in other people's lives. I don't know about you, but that's awesome. You know, I use the, the story uh, when, when Moses, you know, Moses was on the backside of the desert because he made a mistake. He had a calling on the God, on God on his life to be a deliverer of Israel, but he did it his own way. And he spent 40 years in, in Pharaoh's house, thought he was somebody, and then he spent 40 years on the back of the, the, the backside of the desert thinking he was not nobody. He lost it. He ruined his, his, his opportunity. He made a mess of it. And he's on the backside of the desert, and he sees this burning bush that gets, a, that, that gets his attention. And God tells him how he's going to go back to Israel and free Israel from this bondage. And he said he's going to bring, and one of the signs that he's going to do this is that he's going to bring Israel back. He's going to send Moses to redeem and rescue and deliver Israel. And he's going to bring Israel, the whole nation, not just a few people, not just a few tribes. Or people, but he's going to bring the whole nation to the exact same mountain where he is seeing God at this burning bush. That's one of the signs. And then he's going to spend 40 years bringing Israel to the promised land. It was only supposed to take 11 days to, to uh, bring Israel to the promised land, but because of sin, because of Israel's own failure, they wandered around in circles in the, in the wilderness. But that's a whole other story. Mo I mean, just picture Moses sending the burning bush experience. He had just made a mess. He's on the backside of the desert <clears throat> and just watching sheep, which is not his calling. His calling is to lead people, not lead uh, a four-footed animal uh, that makes wool. He was supposed to be, uh, and so he's on the backside of the desert. He sees this burning bush experience, and God tells him he's going to be the, a deliverer, and he's going to bring the whole nation of Israel to the same mountain that he's seen in this burning bush right now. Why do I say that? I love that story because I, my own personal experience with God is seeing myself walking with God in, the, in, in, in a garden-like uh, scenery, walking with my Abba. And I believe God wants to use my life. And I'm using this as an example. God wants to use my life in my own personal relationship with God. So I can help bring other people to the same burning bush, to the same garden experience I have in their own personal way. So they, they too can have their own personal relationship with God. 
and I want to minister to you so you can have your own personal relationship with God, your own burning bush experience, your own garden experience, your own personal re relationship with God so God can use you, restore your life um, or may need to be restored so that God can use you as the Spirit of God has anointed you so you can bring people to their own personal relationship with God. Their own burning bush experience. Their own garden experience. Their own throne room with God experience. However, however you picture yourself with God when you have those most intimate moments that you can bring people to experience that own relationship with God. Because it's in this relationship with God that you have everything you need. It's in this relationship with God that you can ask anything in His name and He says He will do it. Jesus did nothing without spending time with the Father. Jesus didn't even start his ministry until he received the Holy Spirit. He told his own disciples that they were not to start their own ministry until they were supposed to tarry until they received the Holy Spirit. If you have God and you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is upon you and he has anointed you that you can set the captives free. But he's not going to... But you might if you look at your life, how's God going to use my life? My life is a bunch of ruins because of the sin I've committed or because of what people have done to me. Or maybe both. Maybe it's a combination of both. And maybe it's your whole life story is so complicated. How is God going to even figure out the pieces? I'm going to put them back together. I'm going to show you some scriptures this morning how God wants to restore double. And one of those scriptures is a scripture that we just read here in, in Ezekiel 36. And God says, when I cleanse you from your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities and the ruins shall be rebuilt. And he goes, the desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying and desolate in the sight of all who pass by, so that all will say... That the land that was desolate had become like the Garden of Eden, and the wasted, desolate, ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. God wants to do such a miracle in your life that He not only cleanses you from your sins, which He's done through Jesus Christ, but God wants to do such a miracle in your life that all who pass by, all who see your life that was so desolate and ruined, whether it was because you were a victim of something, or whether you, you made a mess of something, or a combination thereof, that God will see all of the, 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 this life that was desolate, ruined, whatever, is now fortified and inhabited and it's purposeful, and it's like the Garden of Eden once again. God wants to bless your life, and God wants to bless your life so it's blessed, doubly blessed, than it's ever been blessed before. <clears throat> Go with me real quick to Isaiah chapter 61. We're not going to read the whole passage again, but I do want to uh, highlight a couple things here that we saw last week in connection with our, our message this morning. But Isaiah 61, in verse 7, God says, Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Twice that word double was used in that one particular passage of scripture. You know, shame. You could, again, you, you might be experiencing shame because of your own folly. Or I've heard it over and over again from those who have been victimized. Those who have been abused. Those who have been violated. How they feel so shame. Even though they're not the ones that did it. Even though in real reality it's not their fault. Yet they feel shame. They feel like it's their fault. God wants to restore the devil. Whether it's because of you or someone else or a combination thereof. Maybe someone's done something to you, but your reaction, you made it worse. And so it's a combination of what someone did to you, but now you, your reaction to it made it just worse. And there's a combination of their shame and your shame combined. But God says instead of shame, you shall have double. God is going to give you honor. God, God says if you humble yourself before him, he will exalt you. He says in uh, uh, Psalm 89, and we looked at this last week, in uh, Psalm 89, God says uh, his, in his righteousness will exalt you. God 
had Jesus has become your sin, that you might become the righteous God in him. And in this righteous God says, he will exalt you. You know, if, if you don't have honor, people won't listen to you. If you don't have honor, people won't follow you. You won't have any influence. But you, you're like, how can I have influence because I'll have a shame? God says in his word that he, instead of, sh instead of shame, not in addition to shame, God's not going to use your shame. Instead of shame, instead of desolate, he is going to give you double and you're looking at your life. How is that even possible? What, what is not possible with man, what is impossible with man, is possible with God. We're talking about God now. We're talking about Scripture here. We're talking about what God has promised. And God says, instead of shame, you shall have double honor. And he says, instead of confusion, they shall be joyous in the portion. Therefore, in their land, you know, when it's, it, 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 in, in this poetic uh, pro prophecies that we're reading from Ezekiel and also Isaiah, it's talking about land. It's talking about cities. You can you can you can uh, interpret that to be your life, your influence, your inhabitation. Where do you dwell? I'm just talking about the brick and mortar. I'm not talking about necessarily the house, but it could be the house. It could be your family. It could be your tribe. It could be your, your employment, your, uh, your, your, your vocation, your circle of influence. It could be your community, your neighbors and whatnot. It could be your state and, and, and political influence. It's where you dwell. It's your habitation, your land. Where are you? You know, uh, uh, um, the place where you work. Maybe, maybe you don't even like it. Maybe you want to get out of this place. But that's where you are right now. Maybe you feel like you're in Egypt in bondage. Or maybe like Ezekiel, you feel like you're in, 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 uh, you're in uh, like Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Maybe you feel like you're in bondage or exile. Whatever you feel like you are. And maybe it's because of your folly or, or others. Or, or maybe it's because of this whole COVID and everything else that's happened. Your, your life is not ruled by the circumstances. Your, rule, your life is governed by God and His Word. Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Don't say, God, you can't what God says you can. God wants to restore double honor. And he says, <clears throat> therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. This double that we're talking about, this grace, this mercy we're talking about, is not based on you. It's based on him. It's not based on your goodness. It's based on his goodness. And we're going to start talking about that next week. When we talk about resting in His goodness. You need to rest. You need to trust. You need to rely on His goodness, not yours. But when God says you shall and, and, uh, possess double, <clears throat> then double you shall possess. Does that, that make sense? We need to receive all the promises of God. In Him, Christ, are yes, in Him, amen, to the glory of God, by us. That's 2 Corinthians 1.20. All the promises. And all means all. Sherry and I had a conversation about that this week. All means all. And all the promises of God are in Him, in Christ, are yes. And in Him, amen, to the glory of God. Ask any thing in my name, and I will do it, that the Father might be glorified in the Son. John 14.14-15-16. 14, 14 Twice in, that, twice in two verses, God, Jesus says, Ask anything in my name, and I will do it. That he may be glorified. God is glorified when he shows you his goodness. When he restores double. When he gives you double honor instead of shame. God wants to bless your life. God wants to take these runes, these broken pieces, and mold it into clay, and mold it into something beautiful. He says in Psalm 90, verse 17, that the beauty of the Lord is upon us. And He will establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's His beauty that will establish you. It's His beauty that will, will, will give you double. It's His beauty that will make whatever is ugly beautiful. God beautifies anything he touches. Even this burning bush was beautiful. 
I've never seen a burning bush that's beautiful, but this one was because it was it was Moses was so intrigued by it. It caught his attention. God will make whatever is ugly, whatever is dysfunctional, whatever is desolate, whatever is dead in your life, God will make beautiful because he's the living God. <clears throat> he's the light. Hopefully this is making sense so far and I'm just barely getting started. <clears throat> let's go, let's, let's switch gears here a little bit. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49, verse 18. Lift up your eyes, look around and see, and these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as an ornament, and bind them as you as the you as a, a blind does. Now that's a very good verse, but I actually want to go to verse eight, not eighteen. Sorry. Isaiah forty-nine, verse eight. I actually want to go back. Yeah, verse eight. That's what I want. Sorry, got distracted. That says the Lord. In an acceptable time, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Notice the past tense. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritage. Excuse me, I'm just uh, checking something real quick. Okay, Alright, just checking the King James real quick. There's a lot in this verse right here. But God says, in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I have heard you. What's the day of salvation? Salvation, here in the Hebrew, is Yeshua. You know, Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua. It means the Lord is my salvation. In the Greek, if this was translated into the Greek, it's soteria. Its root is soza. And salvation, by definition, means healing. It means wholeness. It means provision. It means deliverance. It, salvation is not just your sins being forgiven. That's one of it. That's one aspect of salvation. But it's all an all-inclusive word. Because the curse has been reversed, because you have been forgiven, there's no more curse in your life. You are blessed in that curse. God has taken your curse, your sin, as far as the east is from the west. He who knew no sin became sin that you might become, that you might be born of the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus. We need to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.11. But he says, in the sepulchre time, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. Because we have salvation, we have deliverance. But it's a gift, it's a seed, it's a life. It's the tree of life that keeps on giving. It happened one day at the cross. But it's a tree of life. It's a living organism. It keeps giving. That makes sense? When you have a seed, we are born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the enduring word of God. It's a living word. This word that I held up, it, 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 it's not just the leather and the ink and, and the nice pretty pages. And it, what, it, it, it's not the red or the ink. It's the living word. Paul says in Corinthians that we are living epistles. It's not written by ink, but it's written by the blood. The life-giving blood of Jesus Christ. And he, Jesus said that the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And his living word, his spirit-filled life is telling you today that in the day of salvation, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people. God has made a covenant with you. 
That's why I love communion, where we are reminded of our blood covenant with God. That is better than the old covenant, which we're reading of, but, but, but it points to Jesus Christ. Because in the new covenant, and we read this in Hebrews chapter 8, that God says, I will never remember your sins anymore. That is awesome. That is our covenant. God doesn't remember them. If God doesn't remember them, why are we? And get, I will reserve you to give you out of covenant people to restore the earth and to cause them to inherit the desolate heritage. God wants to restore. God wants to restore. God wants to bring revival to our nation. God wants to bring revival to your family. God wants to bring revival to your life. And it starts with salvation. It starts with God wants to restore. God wants to keep us coming. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 58. You know, most of these uh, prophecies that we're reading now, they all point to Jesus. Actually, uh, there's a verse in John that says, you search the scriptures because of them you think you have eternal life, but they testify of me. The scriptures testify of Jesus. Isaiah 58, 11 and 12 says, The Lord will give you continually. It's not just one time. You didn't just receive from the Lord when you received Christ. That was the seed. That was the genesis of things. That was the starting point. And in that seed is everything you need. Everything an apple tree needs is in the seed. The blossoms, the, 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 the sap, the branches, the leaves, the apples, even the more apple seeds. They're all in that seed. The Lord will guide you continually. How many of we know we need His guide? We need His guidance. The Spirit of truth, the, the, the Holy Spirit that Jesus said will come, His anointing is our guide. How, you know, we get a lot of requests, and we, we even have our own prayer requests at many times, where we just need simple guidance. We get people asking for healing, we get people asking for miracles, we get people asking for a lot of things, but we get a lot of people asking for direction. Wisdom. He says, I will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. Even when there's drought, God says, I will satisfy your soul and strengthen your bones. And you shall be like a watered garden. A garden. It's life. It's full of life. It's water. It's, it's, it's healthy. And like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And those from among you shall build the old waste places. And you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. And you shall be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of the streets to dwell in. You know, there's a lot here I could read. And I could read Isaiah 58. The whole chapter is great. great. But some of us you, you look at your life and, you, you, you know, either you or other people or society have put names on you. Whether it be you were an alcoholic, you were an abuser, you were a victim, you were, you were uh, maybe you were raped, maybe you were an abuse. Maybe you're a sinner, maybe you committed all kinds of sins, there's all kinds of titles and labels we can put on it. Maybe you were an adulterer, maybe you were a murderer, maybe you were, you know, whatever the case may be. But God says, I, you, you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. God wants to have a relationship with you that he not only, ruin, he not only restores all the ruins in your life, but God anoints you in such a way that not only does your life become like a well-watered garden, but you are giving life. You are a resource. You are a channel by which the Spirit of God, the nature of God, uh, is able to go and restore other people's lives. God wants to use you. I don't, I, I don't care what you've done in one sense of the word. I care what He's done. And I care what He says. And He wants to restore. He I, I don't care what COVID says. I don't care what any of this says. I care what this says. 
And this says that your God wants to restore, first of all, he wants a relationship with you. Because all the promises mean nothing in one sense if you don't have a relationship with God. It starts there. You need to be connected to the body. You need to abide in him and he abide in you. His word abide in you. Ask what you will and he'll give it to you. You know, of the six times that Jesus says, ask you in my name, that's one of the well, that's one of the areas where there is a qualifier, and we need to abide in him. We need to abide in him. Because apart from him, you can't do nothing. None of this can happen. None of these promises uh, will come about if you're not abiding in him. G G even Jesus abided in his own Father. The creator of the world, the savior of the world, abided in the Father. We are too. Jesus didn't even start his ministry without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But, God, but at the same point in time, I'm also making a picture. I don't care how rude, I don't care how bad it is, I don't care what you've done. If God says he remembers your sin no more, why do I care about it? <laughs> Who am I to point fingers at you when God says he, he won't even remember your sins? What audacity do I have to even bring them up? Or acknowledge it. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, I should not be seeing your sin. I should be seeing Jesus. I'm not talking about because of what you've done. I haven't done. I should in my perception. It says we are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. It's plural. We are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. If I'm the righteous of God, so are you. It says we, not just me. It's we are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. That's very important. Hopefully I'm making sense. Let's go to another scripture here. Go with me to Amos. If you can find Amos. You are near Isaiah, so go to the right, about five books. Oh, no, a little more than that. About seven, eight books. The right, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos chapter 9. I'll pick up verse 14. <clears throat> it says, I will bring back the captives of is my people, Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. And they shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. And I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Just another passage of scripture that's, that's full of life. It's full of promise. And all, again, all the promises of God are yes in Him. Amen. To the glory of the Father by us. God wants to plant you. God wants to make you fruitful. I see life. I see restoration in this verse. I see uh, 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 influence. I see, I see healthy. I see goodness. We have a good God. And he has nothing but good for you. He has nothing but good for you. You don't need to go through a bunch of pain. Christ took your pain. Christ took it, took it for you. Anyway, there's just a lot here. God wants to rebuild. He wants to, he, he wants to the waste cities. And there's some waste of stuff in our lives sometimes, some of us. We, some of us have wasted time, wasted resources, wasted our lives even. And some worse than bad. I mean, we did not just waste it, but it's molded. I know that's just a gross. Uh, my wife just gave me a sign with that. <laughs> but God wants to take whatever's been rusted, whatever's been molded, whatever's been, well, whatever be on repair. And now we just rebuild it, but make it restore double instead of shame. Double honor. You might have wasted it. But God says he will restore the waste of years. Joel chapter 2. The canker worm, the, 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 the locusts have, have just wasted and just devoured it. So there's nothing even recognizable. But God is a restoring God. Let's go to some new scriptures. Let's go to Job. Job 42. Right before Psalms. Job 42, the last chapter of the book. Job 42, verse 10. 
It says, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. There's a lot here. I'm not going to read the whole story. Uh, chapter 42, most of it is very beautiful, very awesome. But if you know the story of Job, he lost everything. His life was a bunch of ruins. And then he had a, some friends who were not very friendly. <laughs> to me, they were almost like putting salt on the wound. He had one friend who, 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 Elihu, who was, didn't give a good answer. And I love listening to Elihu's answers. But the Lord prayed for his friends, despite <laughs> what had happened, what, despite what they said. He said, and, he, and indeed the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. He goes on to say in verse 11, Then all of his brothers and all his sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house, and they consoled him and comforted him for all the mercy the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. There's just a lot here. But, you know, what I get out of that, one of the things I get out of that is that all who saw his life before and saw all that he lost and all that he went through. And now they're seeing the restoration. Now they're seeing and they're, they're, they're witnessing it. They're a part of it. You know, your life is a living epistle. I already alluded to that. And God wants to use your life and the restoration he wants to do in your life as a testimony, as a witness to those who pass by so they can see the restoration going on in your life. Let's go with me to uh, Isaiah chapter 40. I know I'm having you bounce around a lot in the scripture. But Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 2. It says, Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her. You know, anytime I see the word Jerusalem, I think of the church. I think of the bride because it says in uh, Revelation chapter 21, he says, let me now show you the bride, the bride of Christ. And then and right when he says those words, the new Jerusalem comes down from above. Zion, the city of God, the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. He says, speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she had received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That is beautiful. Beautiful. God, and I don't know what you might have gone through. How long you have gone through it. But God is saying today, your warfare is ended. Your iniquity is is pardon, and you shall receive double for all your sins. That's beautiful. That's the gospel. This is Old Testament, but like I said, Scripture speaks to Christ. Amen. Jeremiah. One book to the right. Jeremiah. Chapter 16, verse 18. And first I will repay double, that word's coming up a lot here, double for their iniquity and their sin, because they have defiled my land, they have filled my inheritance with their carcasses. Anyway, it goes on and on. <clears throat> but God promises that he is going to restore double. He goes on and he describes how horrible it was, how wicked they were. But God wants to restore double. Double for your sins. <clears throat> how can he do that? Because he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteous God. We might, what we, sin is ugly. Sin is horrible. And he who sows the flesh of the flesh will reap corruption, Paul says. Even in the New Testament. But no matter how bad we made it, how ugly it's gone. And I'm not condoning sin. I'm not condoning any of that. It's still ugly. You, you, can, 
you can continue to go down that road and, and, and re reap corruption. Or you can repent. You can turn to God and let Him restore your life. Even restore your desires and cleanse them. Hopefully I'm making sense. Go with me to Zechariah. Zechariah. Second to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah. Chapter 9. Verse 12. Let's return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. Return to the stronghold. You know, you can either let sin, your own pride, become a, a stronghold in your life, or you can, in a sense, let God be your strong tower. Let God be your stronghold. And he says, you prisoners of hope. You know, some of us have been prisoners of sin too long. God has translated out of, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We read last week how he has anointed us with the spirit of God that we can bring, we can uh, heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. You know, some people have been prisoners of hope in this sense. You know, there's a verse that people quote all the time. That where, where, where hope is deferred, the heart is sick. And I, I probably misquote, uh, I'm probably just paraphrasing that. And I've had so many people through the years that says, Pastor Dave, I, uh, uh, my, my heart's sick because my hope has been deferred. And that's where they camp out. They're almost validating a sick heart. <laughs> Who wants a sick heart? And I understand how being deferred makes a heart sick. I understand that I've been there. But if you're going to quote the verse, finish the verse. It says, but when the answer comes, it's like a tree of life. I'm not focused on what I don't have. I'm focused on what I do have in Jesus Christ. And I'm not just a prisoner of hope. He is my hope. And this is my hope. Christ in me, the hope of glory. God wants, I don't, I, he goes, return to the stronghold, you prisoner of hope. Even today, even today, I made COVID, I made everything going on, and you look at your life, and you look like, you woke up this morning, and it's just going to be another day. No, even today, even today, everything going on in the world, everything going on in our society, mid COVID, and made everything else, even today, God says, I declare that I will restore double to you. God is good. God is good. You know, even I'm not going to go into detail, but we've had some things happen to us in recent months, even recent years. I guess actually. And we can go through the whole story. It's horrible. It's just pure evil, some of the things that have happened. But our source is not them. Our source is not the circumstances or situation. Our source is God. And God is in the process right now of restoring everything. Actually, he's restored more than double. He's restored seven times as much. And God is good. People, there are some people who try to do nothing but destroy our lives and ministry, and it's actually multiplying. Right before our eyes, right? Even today, God is restoring double in our lives in so many aspects. I wish I could just share everything. God is doing it. Because in, the, in a sense, God will get the last laugh. And so, um, what the enemy has meant for harm, God is turn it around for our good. And so it's just awesome. Go with me to the book of Jude. Now, Dave, you're really using a lot of unpopular scriptures. Jude. Next to the last book of the Bible. Jude. And we'll pick it up in verse 21. Let's go ahead and back it up to verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, we've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit in this series. The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth, your guidance. The Spirit of God is upon us because He is anointing us to heal the brokenhearted. Ask anything in my name and I will do it in context of Him talking about the Holy Spirit who will come. But you beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, I need to do a teaching on this soon. We need to pray in the Holy Spirit. We need to pray in the Spirit more. We need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have uh, articles and, and resources on our website that will, will guide you to that, and I need to teach on this more. But we, church, we need to build ourselves up in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. There's not another way you build yourself up in the most holy faith. Isaiah calls it, and Paul quotes from Isaiah, it's the refreshing of the saints. We need to be refreshed by praying in the Holy Spirit. Whatever's going on, whatever's going on naturally, whatever circumstances we're enduring, and mid COVID, amid uh, our circumstances, we need to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, but we build that faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. And we need to exercise more. We don't, we don't need to wait for something uh, to happen. We don't need to wait till we're out of crossroads needing wisdom. We need to have a lifestyle of praying in the Holy Spirit. We need to be a church. You see, if we have to wait, if we're, if we're burnt out dry, that just tells me we're not being, being, we don't have a lifestyle of praying in the Holy Spirit. Because we should always be fresh. We should be ready in season and out of season. And mid-COVID. You know, this COVID, these end-time events, did not catch God by surprise. I mean, I, I, I always say this, but Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, James, uh, they all prophesied these things would happen. So they didn't catch them by surprise. If we're caught by surprise, we haven't been reading. Paul said, perilous times will come. You can, he even said, you can mark this. He didn't necessarily say the time or the hour. And even while he wrote this, he was going through perilous times of the Roman Empire and other things. He wrote these things while he was in prison. Perilous times are going to come. I mean, he, he's telling us why he's in prison. Perilous times are going to come while he's going through perilous times. And yet what he was going wasn't the perilous times he's talking about. Anyway, that's just a little mind twister. Uh, you either take it or leave it. But, you know, we are supposed to build ourselves in the model of faith. We're supposed to be in, we're supposed to be so abiding in him, so connected with our Father through that garden experience, hand in hand, walking with him in the cool of the day, that we have an escape. We have a secret place we can go to no matter what. Where we can build ourselves up in our most holy faith, despite the circumstances, despite what we're going through, and we can build our, we can recharge, and we can stay charged. Verse twenty-one: Keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We're supposed to look for His mercy. It says in Proverbs chapter three that we're to bind His mercy around our neck and write it on the top of our heart. His mercy is supposed to be before. We're supposed to pursue His mercy because the mer His mercy endures forever. You know, you can go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and I love it. It's a time when Israel was out of battle. It was a time when Israel militarily was out of weeks' time, and they had three armies <coughs> coming against them. And King Jehoshaphat prayed and said, Lord, what can we do? And there's a verse in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. It's actually a long verse, but at the end of the verse, at the end of this prayer, Joseph also about makes a, makes a some, he, he ends his prayer, and it used to be one of my favorite verses in high school. Not the whole verse, but this, this, this one phrase in this verse, because it's Joseph also about praying, asking God, what should we do? He says, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's the best place to be all the time. Even if you do know what to do, your prayer should be, Lord, I don't know what to do, my eyes are upon you. Because whatever you do, don't lean on your own wisdom, your own understanding, but in all your ways of knowledge in Him, He will direct your path straight. The most humble thing you can do is say, Lord, I need your help. I need your direction. I need your wisdom. 
Because if your wisdom might be practical and logical, but it's natural. And those who are naturally minded is death, and those who are spiritually minded is life and peace. Even if it's practical, I want to do what God tells me to do. If it means walking around the wall seven times. If it means going to a place called there, to the brook where the ravens come. If it means casting my net on the other side of the boat. If it means walking on the water. Some of these things don't make any practical sense once, once, once one iota. But I, if we can trust God. And he can be our guide. He can be our lead. He says, keep yourself in the, most, in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And well, let me just, I got a comment on that. Eternal life. What's eternal life? Eternal life is not just going to heaven. No, Jesus said it this way in John 17, 3. He, having a re relationship with him. Actually, let's go there real quick. We're going to come back to Jude. Hold your finger there. But let's go to... John 17, 3. John 17, 3, he says, This is eternal life. This is eternal life. That you may know, that they may know you, the one, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Folks, beloved, the eternal life is not just going to heaven and avoiding hell. That's a big, huge, humongous portion. Nobody wants to go to hell. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But that's not eternal life. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ. That's eternal life. And the only ones that are going to go to heaven are those who know Him. I mean, we know the scripture says, Depart from me because I never knew you. Knowing Him is eternal life. And you can experience the benefits of eternal life here. Go back to me, with me to Jude. Jude, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> unto eternal life. And I some have compassion making a distinction. But others say with fear, pouring them out of the fire, hating even the garment of my flesh. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stuff. <coughs> and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Go with me to Proverbs, chapter 2. Actually, I'll go over the Proverbs if I have time. Go with me to Isaiah 42. Sorry, correction in that. Isaiah 42. And I'll probably end with Proverbs. Isaiah 42. It says, Doth God, God the Lord of heaven, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit of those who walk in it, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. That's a relationship with God. God's called you into a right relationship with Him. And will uphold your hand. And I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people. We've already read something like that. And as a light to the Gentiles. To open blind eyes. That sounds like what we talked about last week. To bring out prisons from the prison. And those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. New things I declare. We're talking about the garden restored. New things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. There's a lot here I can uh, elaborate on, but God is when he wants to restore you, is he also he wants to use you to set the captives free. Before they spring up, God tells them of you. Got new things he declares. He pickies back on this, and we go to we turn it on the page to Isaiah 43. 43, we'll pick up in verse 18. It's the same context. Just a few verses later. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Don't, don't go down memory lane with some of this stuff. 
Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself, and they shall declare my praise. You know, this whole picture of, of uh, uh, a street in the wilderness and, 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 and rivers and Rivers in the desert. You know, the garden, one of the things I see of the garden, I mean, he spends five verses talking about this river that flows from Eden into this garden. And then Exodus and four, through four rivers that, that, that water there. This is, the, this is where the tree of life is. This is where the garden of God. You know, and it talks about the tree of life in Revelation chapter 22, the same river. In the midst of the river was the tree of life. It's this river. God, the Spirit of God is like a river. It's refreshing. We talked about it the other week when we talked about Psalm 23. He leads me by still waters. God wants to restore, refresh you with the river of life. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. God wants to do such a restoration in your life that this river is flowing in you and through you to heal you, to restore you, to use you. Don't dwell on the past. Don't even consider it. God's doing a new thing. And some of you need to hear this. Whatever has happened because of what you have done or others have done or both, you need to forget it. God says he doesn't remember it no more. Dwell on what God is doing, not what you have done or haven't done. You can't change the past, but you can change your future. God is doing a new thing. Don't focus on the past. Don't keep bringing it up. Stop. Let some things that are dead just be buried. God is doing something new. He wants to do something new in your life. Go with me to Proverbs 2 and we'll close. I'm going to start with the beginning of the and, uh, chapter my son if you receive my words and treasure my commands within, within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding yet if you cry for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth and come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield of those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice and he preserves the way of the saints. And you will understand the righteous, understand righteousness and justice, equity in every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who lead the path of uprightness, who walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who, who are devious in their paths. There's a lot here. God wants to protect. And so we're going to close here, but let's go back to Ezekiel. As we conclude this portion of our series, Ezekiel 36, 33. Why did I go to Proverbs? I, I, you know, there's so much in Proverbs, especially the first couple of chapters. I just really love. He says, wisdom is crying out in the streets. There's so much wisdom that we can find in the relationship with God. As we are walking with Him hand in hand, in the cool of the day, throughout the day, whatever we need, we can get whatever wisdom we need to, one, live a holy, righteous life, but also to make wise decisions that are not based on the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of God. James talks about two different kinds of wisdom. Two different kinds of wisdom. We got the wisdom, he calls it the wisdom that's earthly or sensual, demonic, he calls it. 
are the wisdom that's from above. I don't want earthly, sensual wisdom that's demonic. I want wisdom that's from above. And that wisdom, God says, and also James said, he will give it to us deliberately and freely if we ask him. But we need a relationship with him. God has restored our relationship with him so that we can live righteously, so we can live holy, so that we can live a life of wisdom, a life of plenty. You know, God wants to restore double. God wants to restore the rooms. But if he restores the rooms, but you don't know how to live wisely, you'll just, you'll just make a mess thing all over again. We don't want to get down the same path that got us to where we were. We also want to protect ourselves as best we can you know, from, from evil in any way, whatever to be a victim again or whatever the case may be. Again, I'm not painting a picture that if you've been a victim of something, it's necessarily your fault. You know, it's, uh, but regardless of what's happened, God wants to restore and God wants to use you. But part of this, part of this picture of being uh, a, a, a restorer of the breach, part of this picture of God restoring the rooms and making your life like a, the, 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 the Garden of Eden again. See, the Garden of Eden was not just a, 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 an oasis. The Garden of Eden was not just a peaceful place. It was also resourceful. It was fruitful. Something that's fruitful. Something that, that is a source of where the river flows and waters the rest of the earth is something that's resourceful. God wants to use you. But God can't use you even if he restores your life, but you don't have wisdom to live your life with integrity. You don't have, you don't, you don't have wisdom to build yourself in your most holy faith. You don't have wisdom because you are not connected to the vine. You might be born again, but you're not abiding in him. I want people not I don't want people to see my goodness. I want people to see his goodness in my life and through my life. I want people to look at my life and see Jesus, not Dave. I want him the people to look at my life and see the wisdom of God, the spirit of God, the nature of God, not my nature. That makes sense. And there's so much wisdom, but we need to walk with him. He says, My son. He starts out the, the whole chapter, my son. Well, I, I see myself as a child of God. It says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we might be called the children of God. It goes on to say in verse 2, that we will be like Him when we see Him as He is. I want to be like Him, but i got to see Him as He is, not see me as I am, or as I was. That makes sense? My focus is on Him. But I'm a child of God. I want to act like a child of God. I want to manifest or, or demonstrate being a child of God with wisdom, integrity, and the miraculous. But i got to abide in Him. Because apart from Him, I can't do anything. But if I, part, if I am abiding in Him, I can ask anything of Him, and He will do it. And we end by going back to our, our scripture in Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities. I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the rooms shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled. Because, you know, some of this is a process. There's a rebuilding process. There's a tilling process. Instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by, for they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden and the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Something that's fortified, something that's inhabited is resourceful. How many of you want to live in a fortified house? An uh, 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 inhabited house. You know, I don't like being in a lonely home. I don't like being in a a home that's going to fall apart. You know, sometimes Sherry and I will take walks. <clears throat> and some of the walks we go on, we look at different houses, and we, we don't know what the inside looks like, but we we can tell from the outside some things. How how would we rebuild a house? How would we change the landscaping? Some of them, total do-over. Some, you know, just bring the bulldozer. You know, 
some, you know, we might change this, we might change that. But it's a, you know, I, the ones that are really just some, the bulldozer houses that I just called, you know, sometimes I would, in some ways, would love to have a house like that and just something that was just desolate and see it rebuilt. I'm just using that as an example. I'm just like fantasizing with some of that stuff. If that makes sense. Because I see in, in that, that's what God wants to do in my life. That's what God wants to do in your life. However desolate it may be, God wants to make it beautiful again. Fortified and inhabited. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will this is just a verse that's filled with promise. And God says he will do it. God says he will do it. He didn't even mean to tack on that last part. But he does just so because we need to hear it. And God says he will do it. God wants to do such a restoration in your life. And this is being echoed in a lot of the verses we read. So that the, all who pass by can see it. Your life is supposed to be a lighthouse. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. And God wants to do such a, a work in your life. And not only in your life, but through your life. To help rebuild other lives that are broken. God wants to use you. God wants, but most importantly, God wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want religion. He wants a relationship. You know, my wife doesn't want me to just go through the motions. She wants a relationship. Anything else, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna end well. It's not gonna go well. It's not gonna be real. But I want a real, authentic relationship with God. Anything else, I'm not interested, because it's only God in me and through me that can make my life in anything. But He can make anything that's ugly beautiful in life. God wants a relationship with you. The garden is restored. We can come freely to the Son of Grace. You can come freely to the Tree of Life. You can, He's open 24-7. The supply is there before the need. We're going to talk about that a little bit when we get to our next, kind of part two of this series. But I will talk about the rest restored. God wants, to, he, he, you know, it just is so much in the Sabbath rest. And, and uh, uh, I want to I don't want to uh, spill the beans for all that. But hopefully this has encouraged you. Hopefully this has revived you. You know, I was in a season recently where I just kind of lost my motivation because of some things that have happened and whatnot. But over the last week or so, I just, I told my wife that I, I feel like that motivation is back. And, uh, and so uh, uh, I'm a little busy and getting some things in, in motion, but I'm back. And, and uh, some of you might not even know I left. But, uh, uh, you know, I know. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, just anyway, I'm excited. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. And Lord, uh, I just pray that you would confirm your word to everyone who needs to hear it. Um, in a way that's very personable to them. And we worship you. We magnify you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks for every good and perfect gift comes from you. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. And uh, right here. And uh, God bless you.